Let's have a look at task four from Internal Accounting Systems and Controls Sample Assessment 1. This task is about monitoring of accounting systems and how they work in practice. So notice we've got quite a lot of information provided in the scenario here. So we want to make sure that we're reading this with purpose. We don't want to read through it all, then read the requirement and then have to read it all again. So let's just jump ahead to the requirement, which we, which we can see here in bold text. We need to analyse the potential deficiencies in the system outlined above, together with their cause and impact. So we need to read through this, identify the weaknesses, what is the cause of the weakness and what is the consequence of the weakness. Now, before we start looking at this, it's worthwhile thinking about the marking scheme for this. And in the suggested solutions provided by AAT, it tells us that if we want to achieve top marks for this band, the response will include a thorough evaluation linked to the scenario. So when we start reading this, we'll discover this is about the sales system. So what we need to do is make sure that you haven't simply memorized potential weaknesses in a sales system and then you just fill your answer with memorized answers. Yeah, you need to make sure that your answer relates to the information provided in the scenario. So this question is assessing your analysis skills, not your memory skills. The suggested answers also say that we need to have overall demonstration of excellent understanding of the potential issues and the poor impact of those controls. And it clarifies as well, if you want to get anywhere near top marks here, you need to make sure that you talk about all of the issues that required in the task. So you need to identify the deficiencies, but also the cause and the impact. There are three things for you to do. And if you only do one of them, then you're going to limit your marks. If you only do two of them, you're going to limit your marks. You can only get good marks if you do all three here. So let's go through the information now, step by step, and see if we can identify those weaknesses. And I'm going to use the highlighter tool provided in the exam software to help us pinpoint the particular issues. So it tells us the current system for customers to place orders and for sales to be recorded are, so orders are placed by customers either verbally or in writing. So the weakness we have here is that we could have verbal orders. Now, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with verbal orders. It's just that if we make any mistakes, then the customers may disagree with us and refuse to pay. So we need to make sure that any verbal orders are backed up with a, a confirmation from us to them. So everything's in writing. We have documentary evidence of the order. And if they can say, yeah, I agree to this, this you know, confirmation, then if there's any dispute in the future, we'll be able to fall back on that and say, look, this is your confirmation. You, you told us that you agreed with this order. And so you know, we're, we're allowed to invoice you for this now. So here's our answer. Customer orders may be given verbally. That's identifying the deficiency. This is convenient for customers. That's the cause. And then what's the impact? So without written confirmation of the order, any subsequent disputes will be difficult to resolve. So notice by dealing with the deficiency, cause and impact all in one go, it's helping to meet the expectation in the marking scheme that all three areas have been covered. And that's going to allow us to score them the maximum possible marks. We're then told all orders are accepted and processed by the sales department who do not require a specific order number unless it's part of the customer system. So notice the phrasing here, there's the word not included and that's normally a nice signpost that there's a weakness. So there's no order number provided unless the, the customers require that. So what's the significance of this? So if we don't have an order number for all orders, the risk is that an order may be lost. So imagine that 10 orders come in from 10 different customers and we don't have a number for each of them because what we'd expect to see is that the first order would be given a number and then the second order would be given an, another number but the, the next number in sequence. So all those 10 orders would be given a unique number each in sequential order. 
and then those orders would be filed in that order and then somebody should just verify that all orders are there. So imagine if we had order number one, two, three, five, six, seven, well, where's order four? So if order four was missing from the pile, then that would be an indicator for us that possibly that order has gone missing and we've not delivered the goods to the customer. And therefore, we're not going to get the income from that customer. And so we need to make sure that we have numbers for all orders, that they're filed in that order, and we need to verify that none has gone missing. So here's our answer then at the bottom of the screen. Order numbers are not required for all orders. That, that's the deficiency. The cause is, well, it's customer expectations. If they don't want an order, we don't bother giving it to them. And then the impact is that orders may not be fulfilled because those orders may be missing from the sequence. Then we're told that all customers are given a credit account by the sales team to ensure that they place repeat orders. So if we're giving them credit, that, that's a, a nice thing for those customers, so they will want to come back to us again. So that, that, that's a, a useful thing for customers to have. Now again, notice this is the, the second type of way that the, uh, the examiners may test you. Remember in the first sentence we had the word not, and that was a nice signpost to tell us that something doesn't happen and therefore that's a deficiency. Now in the second bullet point though, there's no not included, it just says they do this. Now what we need to do in our heads is think, well, is that good enough? So they tell us what they do, but is that sufficient to have a well-controlled business? And in this case, it's not, because if we just automatically give credit accounts to all customers, well, is there a chance that somebody may buy something and then not pay for it in the future? So, you know, ideally we should be doing some sort of credit check on those customers to verify that they're good for it and that they will pay us in the future. That there's no history of non-payment from those customers. You know, ordinarily we might ask people to pay in advance and then once they become a trusted customer, that's when we would give them credit. So there's the deficiency in the answer box. Credit is given to all customers without performing credit checks. Now notice in the text, it doesn't say that they provide credit checks. So in terms of our exam technique, if it doesn't tell us they do it, we should assume that they don't do it. Yeah, that, that's the standard technique for these sorts of questions. So what is the cause of this weakness? Well, we want to encourage sales. So we're, we're trying to be nice to the customers, aren't we? And then the impact, well, those credit customers may not pay for the goods that they've ordered and received. We're then told that sales orders are passed to the warehouse where they are packed in preparation for delivery or collection by the customer. But what we don't know, though, is, well, what if they didn't have the goods in stock? It tells at the beginning that the orders are placed by the customers and they are accepted and processed by the sales department. But what if we don't have it in stock in the first place? So there's another problem we have. We may accept orders assuming that we can fulfill them, but actually we don't have the stock to do that. And therefore we're not going to deliver it to the customer. It may take a few weeks and that may upset them. Again, notice the technique. It doesn't tell us in the text that they check on inventory availability. So we are allowed to assume that they don't do that. So here's our answer. The sales department does not check on inventory availability before accepting an order. Now, what's the cause? The sales team may not have access to real-time inventory data, so we're, we're having to suppose what is the problem here. And then the impact, orders may be accepted but not fulfilled for a long time, and that would upset our customers. And potentially, they, they may ask for, for some discount or refunds because they had to wait a long time. We're then told that deliveries are made nationwide by a courier. So that, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, we might expect that a courier would be more expensive than us doing it in-house, uh, but it's a perfectly valid way of delivering goods to customers. So that's not necessarily a deficiency. Then we're told local deliveries are made by the warehouse team who ensure that they return a signed delivery note to the warehouse. 
So that's a good thing, isn't it? If we have that signed delivery note, uh, that is proof of delivery, and therefore it's good evidence to enforce payment of the invoice. But notice it doesn't say the same thing for our nationwide deliveries. So we get that delivery note for the local deliveries, but not nationwide. And it doesn't tell us that they do that, so we can assume that it doesn't happen. So here's our answer. Proof of delivery is not available for nationwide deliveries. And what's the cause? We need to speculate on this, that we have no information about the cause in the text. So it could be that they just haven't agreed with the couriers that, that we want these delivery notes. And then the impact, you know, with no proof of delivery, it may be difficult to resolve subsequent disputes with the customers. We may not be able to get paid because the customer may say, well, we didn't get these and we have no way to argue with them. We're then told that these delivery notes are filed and kept by Ian Priest, the warehouse manager, so they can easily address any customer queries in respect of damages and shortages. So again, notice the style of the question. That sounds like a perfectly good thing, doesn't it? It's a good idea that we have this so we can deal with any subsequent disputes. But is that enough? Okay, if we just read a bit further, invoices are prepared by the accounts department and sent by the sales department after the goods have been dispatched. Okay, but ideally, we would want the accounts department to see these delivery notes to verify that the goods have been dispatched and then they can match them with the original order to make sure that the invoice is correct. So if you look at the text at the bottom of the screen now, uh, delivery notes are not sent to the accounts department. There's the deficiency. The cause, well, because the warehouse manager keeps them to deal with customer queries. That's what it tells us in the text in this case. And what's the impact? Well, we may issue some invoices for the incorrect amounts because the invoice does not match with the items actually delivered. So, for example, we may have uh, an order and we create an invoice to match the order, but it could be that the order hasn't been completely fulfilled. So we'll invoice the customer for things that they haven't received yet and they're not going to be happy with that, and they, they may not pay that invoice. So we're told, aren't we, that the invoices are prepared by the accounts department and then sent by the sales department after the goods have been dispatched. Uh, Vicky Wilde, oh, so notice that Vicky's name appears quite a bit in the next few bullet points, and we just recognise the technique in the assessment that there may be a lack of segregation of duties if one person does everything. So just look out for that in your assessment. So Vicky enters them into the accounting system, Vicky sends out customer statements, and Vicky banks any checks and receives, checks received and posts these to the bank for the customer accounts. So Vicky seems to do everything here. So in our answer, we can see that Vicky records the invoices, prepares the statements, and records payments. And the problem here, what's the cause? Well, because there's a lack of segregation of duties here. That, that's the problem here. And the impact that Vicky may be able to divert money from the company for the invoices not recorded on the system. So you remember Vicky's recording these invoices on the accounting system. So she might send the invoice to the customer, but not record it in the accounting system. The money comes in, but because the invoice is not recorded on the accounting system, we're not expecting that money. So she could then send that money to herself. And because she records all the bank transactions, then yeah, she can purposely not record that money coming in. So it won't appear on the statement. It won't appear anywhere. So as far as the customer is concerned, they've paid for the goods, uh, which they've received. Um, but Vicky has the cash. Now remember, in this assessment, there is information about the company provided, and that's in the reference section, which you'll find towards the right menu on the screen, uh, which you can't actually see on the screen at the moment. But in that information, you've got um, information here about the people who work for the business. And we can see that there is only one accounts receivable clerk. So their accounting department is, is quite big. Like we've got a, a number of people working for them here, but there's only one person responsible for accounts receivable. So we can see that there is a lack of segregation of duties here. So for this question, there are 10 marks available and we covered more than you need for those 10 marks. But hopefully that's given you a good idea of the sort of things that you could have talked about to populate your answer here. 
Let's move on to the next part of the question then. So there have been a number of new staff within the organisation recently. All new staff must attend an update to the initial induction sessions every three months to ensure that the importance of internal controls and systems are highlighted regularly. And that, that sounds like a good process. That, that's, that's for good. And then complete the following statements. The accounting system needs to be reviewed to ensure that it is fit for purpose, is working properly. So both of these answers are plausible answers. Either of them could be correct. Um, but in terms of the accounting system, you know, would we be reviewing that on a sort of a, a regular basis to see that it's working properly? You know, we'd probably identify problems with it as we're processing the transactions. So it's unlikely that we're going to review the accounting system as a whole for, for that purpose. But what we should do, though, is on a regular basis, just keep asking ourselves, is this the right accounting system for us? Does it do what we want it to do? Is it really fit for purpose? And then this is something that needs to be done regularly or when a new product is added to the range or there is a change in senior staff. Well, it's unlikely that we're going to have to need to change our accounting system every time we add a new product, and that would be quite a burden, wouldn't it? But it would be a good idea that every time we get a new senior member of staff, that they have a nice objective overview of the system, because they might come in from another business, they might have different experience, and they'll be able to question some of the things that we do to see whether they make sense and question whether, you know, is there a better way of doing it? So that's a good idea. If there's a, a new member of staff, they can perform this review. And then part C, identify whether the following statements are true or false. So as a rapidly growing company, the most cost effective way to improve the accounting system would be to get consultants to create a bespoke accounting system. Well, it tells us that they're rapidly growing, and that tells us that there's quite likely to be frequent changes. And therefore, a bespoke system is unlikely to be able to deal with that. Because when we have a bespoke system, remember bespoke means that we have the system tailored exactly to our needs. But if our needs are changing because of our rapid growth, then it could be that our bespoke system will be quickly out of date. But if we get a standard off-the-shelf package, normally software companies create off-the-shelf packages to be able to be adaptable for lots of different companies under lots of different circumstances. So an off-the-shelf package would be more adaptable and therefore more appropriate for us if we're rapidly growing. So in this case, this is a false statement. We don't want a bespoke system if we're rapidly growing. The second statement, so long as all invoices are stored on a secure portal, there is no need to keep a paper copy. Well, that's true. Yeah, so the government HMRC does not require paper versions of documents. Electronic versions are perfectly fine. So again, as long as we have secure storage, which this statement says there is, there's a secure portal, then it's fine. We don't need a paper copy. And then all accounting staff should be suitably qualified and experienced. Again, notice the word suitably here. So again, if you think about what we're doing, yeah, we may be AAT students and perhaps we're not fully qualified, but that's okay because we can still perform some tasks and as long as we're suitably qualified for the tasks that we're performing. So yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, it, that's going to be good practice that everybody is suitably qualified and experienced.